moving on then a bit to, to um, the relationship between science and ethics and how all that relates to this. So, so I have mentioned this a bit before, this, this uh, way in which objectivity can apply to both. So um, there were these two senses of objectivity, uh, of the term objectivity in widespread in English. You know? so, so there's objectivity as a God's eye view, so objectivity as uh, an absolute position. But there's also the sense in which you can use it in an everyday sense. You know, when we ask someone to be more objective, we're asking them um, to try and stretch the ego a bit, really, or to to um, take a slightly wider perspective. To you know, to try and get out of the cognitive model they may have got stuck in, um, something of that kind. So, um, I think to use objectivity in an incremental way, it's not a complete departure from the way people use it, it is a departure from the way scientists and analytic philosophers usually use it, um, which is the first sense. So, um, basically if we, if we think of beliefs as, you know, not so much true or false, but simply more justified or less justified uh, in experience, and, and um, we've got those, those two basic conditions for um, justification, coherence, and fallibility. Um, so, so the more we've got those, then uh, the more we can have an objective and integrated uh, set of beliefs. Now, um, another thing I, I've mentioned earlier on is the uh, way in which um, representationalism is associated with the fact-value distinction. So if we're going to a avoid representationalism and avoid simply having having a sense of meaning based on possible truth or falsity, then uh, we can't accept the, the sort of classic uh, model by which science is distinguished from, from ethics, for example, factual claims are distinguished from ethics, whereby factual claims have this sort of objective, in the old-fashioned sense, uh, status and values don't. Um, so I would uh, reject really the belief that, that science is intrinsically more objective because it deals with facts. I don't think it's the, the uh, it's not the relationship that scientific theory has with truth or you know, when it, when it represents things out there which makes it uh, objective. It's the way in which it's the the objectivity in the other sense with which science works that makes it effective and makes it objective. Um, so, um, if you take that view of science, this does allow a unified view of objectivity, so it allows us to think of scientific and moral and aesthetic objectivity in the same sort of way, obviously, um, applied in different ways. But the, the, the basic mechanism is the same in each case. Uh, it involves the integration of belief in each case. Um, so, if we try and think of objectivity like this, you know, it's, it's equivalent to integration in effect, and that means it's found uh, not in states of affairs or the relationship between representations and states of affairs. It's found instead in people. Um, it's found in people's habits, it's also it's found that people's habits at an individual level, but also people's habits at a group level. So societies could be more or less objective, or, or groups could be more or less objective in that sense. Um, and the, the habitual attitudes of um, people. Um, so, and I think this is what effectively it, it follows from um, the stuff we did yesterday in a way, is that since we recognise that meaning for us is embodied. I don't see how we can avoid this conclusion in the sense that, that uh, if meaning is embodied, then objectivity must be embodied. Um, it's it's the, um, the way in which we understand things. Um, so so the, uh, the way in which that's particularly focused, I think, is, is in judgment. So, so the point at which we can um, well, we, we, we test and apply our objectivity is when we make a judgment. 
So um, it's not just a question of is this person objective? Uh, you know, is um, you know is Sanger Axter more objective than David Cameron or whatever? You know, the, measuring the person as a whole, because obviously people do vary, as we've been saying. You know, the, the, you want to avoid a, a fixed view about these people, but um, at any one given point where they make a judgment about something, there's going to be a, a set of habits and attitudes and models and so on which are being applied. Hmm. Um, perhaps applied in consultation with others, but uh, you know, so you might think about a, a group judgment which is being applied at a particular time through, through consultation, or you might think uh, focus it on an individual making a judgment in an, in an everyday setting. But either way, it's judgment that becomes the important point, the, the, um, the point at which objectivity can be in some way assessed. Um, so if we're going to talk about better science, improving science or, or progress in science or in ethics or in art, that's going to happen through the people doing it, uh, having better judgments each time they make a judgment of some kind. That makes sense for me. Of, uh, something I've had a problem with, I've raised this with Stephen as well, when, when you hear people talking about the Kalama Sutta and talking about one of the, one of the um, uh, I can't remember the exact wording, but saying that, you know, when should you value things or consider them to be you know, a good thing to do or whatever, or, and um, refers to experience. Um, but also refers to the wise, these people called the wise. <laughs> yeah. And I, I was very, very suspicious of that in terms of, yeah, yeah. it seems at odds with yeah. some of the other ideas in there. Um, it's like almost like just authority coming in through the back door, you know, divine authority or authority of the guru or whatever. But this, being able to see somebody who's wiser than someone else as being somebody who's more integrated, somebody who's more objective, somebody who can, mm. who has more co coherent and, mm. I, I, yeah, yeah. I, I like that. <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's what would enable you to interpret the Kalama Sutta as, as saying that yeah. somebody who is wise would think in, in this particular way. And it also kind of links in with virtue ethics as well. Yeah. It kind of makes sense of that because there's a circularity in virtue ethics mm. that you were talking about yeah. the other day, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's the, the trouble with virtue ethics is it, it, it relies on the person as a whole over time when people change right, right, over time, yeah, yeah. which is why I want to put the emphasis on judgments at a specific time. Yeah, that's um, good. I like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, mm. obviously, in that judgment, mm. yeah, there are various things that can be taken into account, which include the consequences of your actions, for example. Yeah. But, but we'll talk more about that tomorrow. Um, so. Uh, uh, the, the, the key message here is that the criteria are psychological for, for objectivity, that, that uh, they're not just about the evidence, important, important as evidence is in the way that it, it feeds into the total process, but, but um, the, the judgment of objectivity is, is a, a psychological one because it depends on the kind of states that are brought to judgments when we make them. Um, so, at the beginning of the week, you talked about rationalism and how you felt that um, there was a real synergy between these two. During the course of the week, has that just confirmed this synergy? Or have you noticed in any differences from your sort of, your view? Because you were saying that's the thing that you gravitated most to before you came here. Would am I right in saying that? Yeah, I think it's. I didn't really have a uh, a model which took in things that could not be rationally proven, as in the, the aesthetic side. Um, so I would say I would probably swung to a more balanced view of things you can't rationally prove, okay. as well as um, that which you can. So I think I've got a slightly broader view of it now. Um, could this still fit into your rationalist model, or does it break it? Um, I think it... It's a, it's a meta, this is, becomes a meta model, which is one third step sort of bigger than yeah. the rational model. I think it takes into account more of experience than the rationalist model can. And there becomes a sort of a widening. Mm. So that I think, you know, with rational thought, you can only get so far. Um, but it was a, but that, 
doesn't say the rationalist model isn't a useful way of yeah. looking at things. And yeah, I think yeah. I still would, in many contexts, use that because it's easier to articulate mm. than the sort of more aesthetic side of experience, which is harder to pin down using words yeah. and therefore hard to use in an argumentative sort of discussion. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it, I, I probably end up being very vague, trying to use the bigger picture in a lot of contexts. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if, you, if you're within a single cognitive model and you're having a discussion with someone who is pretty much in the same one, there's no problem. You, know, yeah. you, just, you, you accept the same, most basic, same basic assumptions and, mm. and you accept the meanings of the terms you're using. <laughs> this isn't always the yeah. case, but you know, <laughs> if those kind of conditions are met, then all you need to do is reason within the terms of that model. Yes. Mm. And, and maybe that's actually part of our problem as a, as a species, if you like, or a cultural problem, is that you can operate within a particular cognitive model in the scientific technological world that we mm. live in. Mm. Um, and and so the, the the kind of it reinforces this this kind of tendency to hive off morality and aesthetics from technology and science because yeah. for, for all practical purposes because of you know a lot of us buy into similar cultural assumptions and so on we just mm. go along within the same cognitive model mm. Mm. I mean I, I, but what I'm beginning to get in my head around as the week goes on is, is this idea that uh, like, like you're saying you know not ra rationalism rational thought can only get you so far but I, I'm, I'm beginning to get this, this idea more that it's not just that rational thought can only get you so far you can't actually get started with rational thought until you've got some kind of, um, you know, it's a way of understanding aesthetics and meaning and value. And mm -hmm. I think that, that that's I'm not putting it into words very well, but um, I get what you said at the beginning of the week. It's like you, you start to sort of get a sense of what's being said, but you can't actually yeah. articulate it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's what my ramblings are attempting to do. But I'm not. I've been very successful at the moment. <laughs> <clears throat> Do you have any thoughts, Kat?